Good afternoon, distinguished guests, faculty, students, and friends. I am Jacqueline Kett, the Mistress of Ceremonies for today's forum. Today we are here to celebrate the 231st anniversary of our nation's founding charter, the Constitution of the United States. It is an honor to welcome Professor Raymond Koo and Professor Avidan Cover, of both, both from Case Western Reserve University School of Law. The Constitution Day Student Committee is grateful that you have accepted our invitation to speak and to answer questions from our panelists and audience. We all use technology and depend on it as an extension of ourselves. The desire to protect personal data and information from encryption is natural. We therefore have to wonder whether our privacy is at risk. This forum will explore whether our information should legally be kept private. We look forward to hearing the perspectives that the two speakers will present regarding these issues. It is my pleasure to introduce the student panelists, Mr. Parker Glatfelty, Mr. David McGrath, and Mr. Timothy O'Shea. Finally, please join me in welcoming the moderator for today's forum, Ms. Amanda Spangler. Thank you, Ms. Kett. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today, September 17th, 2018, we celebrate the 231st anniversary of the signing of the U.S. Constitution. In 1791, the Constitution was amended through the Bill of Rights, which includes the Fourth Amendment to protect against unwarranted government searches and seizures, and the Fifth Amendment to protect against self-incrimination and ensure due process. These rights can hamper law enforcement and the protection of public safety. As technology develops, and encryption becomes more ubiquitous, accessing information stored on encrypted devices has become increasingly difficult. In the wake of the 2015 San Bernardino terrorist attack, which left 14 people dead and another 22 seriously injured, a federal magistrate judge ordered the tech company Apple to create a software that would disable the security features on the attacker's iPhone, allowing the FBI to access its contents. Apple resisted this court order on the grounds that designing such software would create a backdoor for the government to access and unlock many other encrypted devices. While the FBI was ultimately able to unlock the San Bernardino attacker's iPhone without the help of Apple, the question of the legality and prudence of government-compelled decryption has remained a pressing issue. When tasked with maintaining public safety, protecting the constitutional rights of citizens, and respecting individuals' privacy, how should the government balance these competing objectives? Please silence your cell phone. You never know if a government agent might be listening. Thank you for your courtesy throughout the forum. Professor Ku and Professor Cover will each have 10 minutes for opening statements. Professor Cover, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Declan. Thank you very much to all the students for arranging this event and the faculty for making this possible as well. Um, I want to begin with a little bit of a background uh, just on the Fourth Amendment in general and how it governs our expectations of privacy and sets out, as you so correctly stated, really a balancing regime. Um, you know, as I pulled out of my driveway just uh, the other month, really, a few months ago, uh, I had this moment, I don't know, maybe some of you have had it, uh, I'm 45 now, so certain, this is more common as I've aged, uh, I suddenly forgot where I was going. Uh, and as I glanced uh, up where my cell phone was legally and properly stored in a very safe manner, uh, up on the screen appeared 16 minutes to work, which I had never noticed before. <laughs> uh, turned out actually, for all of the perfections of the, the iPhone, uh, I wasn't going to work, um, but it startled me that the phone should think uh, that that is where I was going and was quite aware that that was commonly what I would do when I would pull out of my driveway. Um, what this led me, of course, uh, to understand and what I think you all understand and appreciate is your phone is storing all kinds of information. That which you consciously place in your phone, but perhaps far more of what you are not aware is going on your phone. Uh, we sort of thoughtlessly agree to terms and conditions for various phone agreements. I need my phone. I need to get out of this Verizon store as quickly as possible. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh, I'm not getting good internet access. I you know, agree to certain buttons that will determine my location right, at every moment 
Because if I don't do that, my ways and my map systems won't work and I will be lost, right? So I am giving up all sorts of information to this phone. And I think we in 2018 are more and more aware than perhaps we were 15 years ago of doing so. And there are, of course, great benefits that come with that. Uh, and I can email people and I store information. I have thousands and thousands of photographs on here. And my health information, how many steps I am taking each day are on this phone. Uh, Countless, countless stuff. A, a library that rivals you know, that of the great li uh, library of Alexandria is there on that phone that we carry in our pocket. And we do all sorts of stuff, uh, particularly those a little bit younger here do even more on their phone than uh, uh, many of us. Um, and, it, and it comes from the mundane to the profound, of course, right? So uh, between 19 and 25-year-olds, 42% of you watch two screens while also on your smartphone. 55% uh, of you, and you know most polls are probably under-reporting, right, are on the toilet uh, with their phone. 71% are in bed, 9% during sex. Uh, and 76%, this is sort of the most profound to me, to avoid being bored are on their smartphones. Um, so we're using it, right, at, at every step of the way, and we get great benefits from this. And of course we understand companies get all sorts of benefits as well, right? They are, they are watching our data, storing it, and they can understand how to target ads to us. So you looked at those ankle high boots one time on Amazon, well, they're following you every step of the way when you're on the Washington Post or Cleveland.com, right? All of that information. But there is also, as Jacqueline said, this balancing that we do. Because with all of that information, of course, the phones and all these other technology are a benefit to the government as well. They, they can watch you, they can monitor you. There's all sorts of information that they can get. And they can get, even if it's not any of you, they can get from the bad guys, as it were. And pick whatever you want, right? Drug dealer, terrorist, white collar criminals. All of this information is accessible. And to limit that information to the government limits the way in which the government can stop bad things from happening. From doing what we want the government to do, right? To protect national security to ensure that the criminal laws are properly enforced. And so it's this balancing that we're always sort of struggling with. So the Fourth Amendment, as we said, really protects against right, unreasonable searches and seizures. Right? So what's, what's reasonable? What's unreasonable? It's this balancing that we are continually struggling with. Right? So we can think of an area that's most sacred. It's there, in fact, in the Fourth Amendment, the text, right? the home. And we can all understand that the government should not be allowed to just barge into our home. Right, rifle through our drawers, take our papers. Right, that would be an unreasonable search. Now, if they have a warrant, if a court has determined there is probable cause to believe that, you are, that a crime is afoot there, right, they may be able to search. That's that balancing. Right? We have a neutral judge making that determination, issuing a warrant. But it gets a little more complicated with technology. Right? So some of the famous Supreme Court cases that some of you may have studied or reviewed, right, what happens if the government uses some infrared heat technology to determine if people are in the home, perhaps engaging in some sort of nefarious uh, illicit drug activity, is that technology, that very innovative technology, a legitimate means for the police to use? Flying a helicopter over the backyard of a home to see if marijuana is growing, right? is that a legitimate means? And similarly, can the government use, and the Supreme Court just last year addressed this uh, opinion, and it came out of actually our appellate district, our federal appellate district, can they use cell site location information, right? All those various towers we see, sometimes very badly disguised as trees, right, that ensure that we can get cell phone access. Thank goodness they're there, right? Otherwise my cell phone doesn't work. It's irritating, or I can't get the score of a game, or what have you, right? But it also enabled the police, in a case involving, ironically, uh, the theft of cell phones. Um, it also enables the police to pinpoint where the criminal suspect is at virtually every stage of his life for over 100 days. So it is this balance that we struggle with. Right? On one hand, can the police, can law enforcement use that very technology that makes our life so much easier to intrude on the privacies of our life? Right? It might sometimes seem, and this is often the case with many of these criminal matters, we say, well, those are the bad guys, so that's okay. Right? In this case, Mr. Carpenter, right? we're, we're maybe okay with that. Many people can maybe make their peace with that. But are we comfortable with the government having access to every step of the way that we act in our cell site location information? That's the struggle that the Fourth Amendment goes through. And so, I guess I've 
not, don't want to bury the lead, but in that case, the Supreme Court held, for example, that no, that sort of search without a warrant, the cell site location information of Mr. Carpenter was unlawful without a warrant. Right? It was considered that the expectation of privacy that we have in that would be significant enough that it needs to be protected by a warrant, by a new, neutral judge. And so again, it's that continual struggle that we go through. Now the issues of encryption that we will delve into further, I'm sure, raise a slightly different issue, but I think it's very important to think about what is this balance of technology and privacy? What, how much do we want the government to be able to do and not do? Because the Fourth Amendment is not always implicated in, in those encryption cases. But it's this other issue, that the companies, these corporations, have all of our information, right, in the cloud. The cell site, the information in the Carpenter case involving the cell site location information, the conceit was that information doesn't belong to you, everything about the cell site location information. That belongs to the phone carrier. So similarly, in the encryption case, right, the information and privacy issues were in some ways controlled by Apple in the San Bernardino case. And so how comfortable are we, and what do we want the Apples of the world, the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Googles, right, to be the arbiters, to determine how and when some, the government goes too far? And I'll just end with, I think, a, a powerful quote by uh, both someone who has actually run for president, but first and foremost, a, a legal scholar, uh, Larry Lessig, uh, who asked, how do we protect liberty when the architectures of control are managed as much by the government as by the private sector. Right? And I think in many respects, that's what the debate uh, that comes from San Bernardino and is one we are struggling with, is one we're going to be wrestling with for ages to come. Right? We are individuals who rely on this infrastructure and we use it, it's indispensable to our society. Right? It's not easy enough to just say, well, don't use cell phones. Right? That doesn't seem a legitimate option, I think, for many of you, for me at least. Um, and so the question then is, to what extent should the law recognize the rights of government to fight, to resist, uh, the, sorry, res the, the private sector to resist governments encroaching on privacy? When and who should make those determinations that it is in the interest of our society uh, for information to be turned over and not? Uh, well, I look forward to hearing from Professor Ku and engaging with the, uh, the, the interrogators <laughs> shortly. Thank you, Professor Cover. Professor Ku, you may begin. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and like Professor Cover, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for participating and inviting me here. I think this is either my second or third appearance uh, at <laughs> one of these events. Uh, and uh, if Professor Cover started out with the story about his iPhone telling him he should be heading to work, uh, my son apparently picked up his phone a couple of weeks ago and it told him he was probably going to Chipotle, uh, which was <laughs> a actually right at the time. So it gives, gives to show you a different set of priorities. Uh, but I, I, to, to start with the theme of balancing, I'm going to simplify it and say that balancing is the danger uh, and the idea that we should be balancing is the biggest threat to our individual liberties today. Uh, Professor Cover and I work together here. We are very much on the same page on pretty much everything. So we'll be curious to see if we get into a whole lot of debate here. But my concern has been historically and as a scholar that we use terms like privacy to essentially cover what essentially becomes a substantive decision often made by the courts, uh, but more often made by law enforcement, the executive branches of government. And that fundamentally flies in the face of what I th see as the value of our Bill of Rights and the Fourth and the Fifth Amendment, that these are textual provisions that limit that discretion and that authority. And yet, when we talk about privacy in particular uh, under the Constitution, we think of it as, well, it's not private. Right? So if it's not private, so if that heat escaping from my garage uh, because I have grow lamps in there growing marijuana it is more than the average heat that would escape from my garage and it's coming out of the walls, well, the courts would say potentially that that's not private. And if it's not private, we don't need to make sure that the search is reasonable and complies with the Fourth Amendment warrant requirement uh, because the Fourth Amendment only protects privacy interests. Right? And the same thing um, when we talk about the Fifth Amendment, we talk about it in terms of when is an individual being compelled to kind of essentially reveal what's inside their minds, right? what, what are their thoughts? Uh, but we also often engage in kind of this odd balancing of, well, as we'll talk about, the if I have a safe, 
the current view is that, well, if the government requires me to turn over a key to that safe, that doesn't violate the Fifth Amendment. But maybe if the government asks me to turn over my password for that safe, then I'm, they're violating the Fifth Amendment. So if they ask me what my four-digit code is for my phone, violation of the Fifth Amendment. If they tell me to put my thumb on the phone, not a violation of the Fifth Amendment. Now, the problem with all this, it seems to get us away from what's fundamentally important, right? So often what we're talking about is kind of the how and when things are supposed to happen. Right? Uh, where we're talking about, well, should the government be looking at our cell phone site data, right, to track us? Or should the government be able to open up your cell phone and see all the information and go through the information there? Uh, or when, right, you know, when can the government get into our house? Uh, as opposed to kind of asking, like, where and what are we trying to do? Like, for, and where and what is the government trying to get from us? Uh, and under what circumstances? Right? So uh, in general, if you think about both the Fourth and the Fifth Amendment, they came out of a concern over unfettered and arbitrary executive abuse. Right? So it, back in that day, it was much easier. We're worried about King George and all the other wonderful monarchs that preceded them right? and their ability to use the legal process of their day uh, to essentially look for evidence of crime. Right? So uh, here's a general writ. Uh, go see if uh, someone is smuggling pro products in and go ahead, go in their warehouse. Right? You, do we need to know whether or not there's any evidence of this? No, right? but you have a legal mandate to go search for this. Uh, if the Star Chamber wants to prosecute you because you're a heretic, uh, what do we do? Do we need evidence that you're a heretic? No, we swear you in under oath to get you to testify truthfully, and then we ask you your views. Right? And then if you fail to answer truthfully, you go to jail. Uh, if you answer truthfully, you go to jail. Right? And, and so the response was we thought all of these processes right, uh, were undermined individual freedom and gave the executive too much authority. Right? But as Professor Cover said earlier, we want the executive branch to, in fact, enforce the laws. Right? When we have criminals, we want them discovered, we want that, uh, the information gathered, and we want their testimony when we could obtain it. Uh, so we're really never actually talking about an absolute right to privacy. We're not talking about an absolute right to not essentially incriminate ourselves. We're asking when can the government start to try to get that information from us. And the danger has been, especially with new technology, that we either ignore that fact, right, because we say, well, it's not private anymore. Right? So, uh, because everyone in here has a camera, right? And by the way, if you really want to protect your privacy, put a little bit of tape in front of the laptop camera there, uh, because it's been known for over a decade now that pretty much anyone can turn that camera on uh, without your authorization. Right? Uh, and same thing with your phone cameras. Right? So, you know, the, if we all are in a world in which that can happen, do we have a privacy interest? And if we don't, because we all know that the government can do this or a hacker can do this, when, why should the government be required to take some additional steps, goes the argument. Uh, and my general position, and I'm sure Professor Cover will share this largely too, is, well, the government needs to because it's the government, right? We're worried about being thrown in jail uh, because of an overzealous prosecutor or because a police officer uh, that may have a hunch that they can't prove or may even have a grudge uh, that they want to satisfy. Uh, if they want me to unlock my phone, well, I, if I have evidence and they know that there's potential evidence of a crime on there, sure, we generally have no problem with that. But if they don't know, right, and what they think is maybe we'll find some evidence on that phone, then we have a problem. Right? And that, that doesn't have anything really to do with whether or not we think it's a compulsion of testimony or not, right? But really, what is controlling the government's discretion? Do they have reason to suspect that Professor Cover is growing marijuana in his garage, right? Or that I uh, might have a you know child uh, slave ring uh, out of a pizza shop, right? Do they have any reason for that? Do they have any evidence uh, for that? And more importantly, do they have any of that that they convince that they can convince some neutral decision maker? that there's enough to go on, more than just that the trust me, uh, I know what I'm doing argument. 
neighborhood. And, and so hopefully today we'll be able to, to flesh that out and, and get to uh, why some of the larger popular issues like is this private or uh, is this uh, compelling my testimony may in fact kind of hide the more important issues uh, beneath these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ku. Uh, we will now proceed with questions from the panelists. Uh, Professor Ku and Professor Cover, you have five minutes to address the question, three minutes to respond to the other speaker's points, and then two minutes to defend your original point. So again, five minutes to answer, three minutes to respond if you aren't the original answerer, and then two minutes to uh, the speaker who originally thought the question was originally addressed to. So Mr. McGrath? Professor Ku, if our privacy is to be protected, how important is it for the court to act as a proactive check on government surveillance? I, I think it's more important actually to have Congress and legislators be the proactive check. Uh, and we're seeing this more and more uh, from the Supreme Court itself, uh, actually uh, calling for and thinking more about the importance of statutory protection for privacy. Uh, because in general, the typical approach is that executive says, well, I want to engage in a search, right? So the law enforcement side of our government. And then the courts become the arbiter of whether or not there's a right uh, to be free from that search or what the requirements are for that search. And uh, based on the work of Professor Akhil Lamar, uh, he shows that in common law before this country was even founded, that was exactly what we were afraid of. And courts were not the protectors of freedom under those circumstances. By getting a warrant uh, from a court, uh, the executive branch, uh, those investigating officers, were essentially immunized uh, for any wrongdoing when they actually engaged in their searches. Right? So uh, the concern there was that, well, at common law, right, that if you were a, a law enforcement officer or claims, uh, a customs and claims official, and you broke into a warehouse without any just cause, you could be sued afterwards uh, for trespass and damage the property. Uh, but a warrant, the court authorization and approval of that immunized it. Right? So uh, Amar's view, and I, I agree with him, is that courts uh, were one of the groups that they wanted to keep out and constrain their discretion, which is why the Fourth Amendment actually lists, uh, you know, sets forth the standard for courts to actually issue warrants. Right? So the concern isn't the executive and the judiciary under those circumstances. The government, you know, executive wants to use all its powers it can to legitimately prosecute crime. Courts are more than happy to help them out in that process because, again, they generally work with those uh, members of law enforcement regularly. Uh, but it, the question is, should the executive have the power to begin with, and not whether the courts should second guess that. So Professor Cover uh, began with a quote from Larry Lessig. Uh, I, and I leave with a quote from Justice Jackson uh, in Youngstown, uh, which was one of the most famous cases involving executive authority in the Supreme Court, where he argued that ours is a government of laws not of men, and that we submit ourselves to rulers only if under rules. Right? And so in the context of criminal prosecution and investigations, the rules are congressional action and authorization. Right? You can use drones. Uh, you can decrypt uh, hard drives uh, under certain circumstances. Uh, the classic example is you can engage in wiretapping of telephone, uh, telephone communications under these sets of rules and under these conditions. Uh, and rather than, I choose to because I think it's useful, uh, and then the court's thinking it's ultimately reasonable. Uh, I agree with very uh, much uh, a lot of what Professor Ku says. I would only, of course, stress the importance of the court when you have uh, a Congress that by and large has abdicated most responsibility in, in, a, in a litany of areas, of course, to be sure, well beyond the confines of this discussion. Um, but when you have an area of national security in particular, sort of under the umbrella in our post 9-11 world, Congress in fact expanded various authorities, sort of you know, uh, bent over backward to enable the executive uh, in all sorts of bases, uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Amendments Act, which en enables uh, the executive to, in the name of national security, really sweep under uh, surveillance uh, really everyone's communications. Uh, but for revelations by Edward Snowden, uh, we would probably be unaware of the mass surveillance that was undertaken in the name of national security. That's something that really all branches of government uh, had a role to play in. And so you, you look to the court to hopefully uh, 
check uh, those kinds of excesses. Um, that is not to say that Congress doesn't have an important and vital role to play. Um, in fact, it's, it's critical that they play a role. We are working under still incredibly antiquated laws governing fast-moving technology. Uh, and so the rules governing interception of emails and what have you rely on laws that were passed by Congress in the 1980s when it wasn't even conceived of really what was email and how data would be considered stored or not. Uh, so it is certainly incumbent upon Congress to act. I think that is certainly the preferred approach in terms of a representative body that can make those determinations. Uh, but the courts do, of course, play a critical role in reining in uh, the legislature. And so, for example, the decision that we've referenced a couple of times, the Carpenter one involving cell site location information, that was the court reacting in a way, in a way that Congress had not yet, in terms of how we've, our technological advances have exceeded the laws and the statutes, and saying, no, this statute permits too much, uh, and reining in. And hopefully, the process would follow that Congress will amend the laws. That's the way the system is supposed to work. We don't always see it uh, being exercised to, to an effective rate, but that, that is the way we would hope that we should see things. Yeah, so I wanted to respond to Professor Cover there, right? The initial question was initiates, right? Who initiates? <laughs> uh, and I agree, right? So the Supreme Court and courts play a fundamental role uh, in kind of providing the floor, right? Making sure uh, that there is a safety net for society. And Carpenter is a wonderful example of that, right? So Carpenter is the cell phone uh, cell tower tracking case. And initially, right, the argument is, well, it's not private. Why? Well, when this moves around, you're sharing that information with your cell phone provider all the time, right? And, you know, if you have an iPhone, your parents or uh, your family can look you up on where's my iPhone, right? So th these things, according to one aspect, are not private because they're simply available to everyone else. And so we don't need a warrant uh, for that. Uh, Carpenter, the majority, raised a slightly different problem. They said, yes, this is just qualitatively different than anything else. Right? But the, we also had a federal statute in place, the Stored Communications Act, which actually provided law enforcement with the ability to request data from carriers like your cell phone operator to access your historical records. Now, the, and I think what they did here is something I've been advocating since uh, basically 2001, uh, was essentially they looked at that statute, which provided procedures for law enforcement to get access to this data, and then they tested that against the principles of the Fourth Amendment, and they found it wanting. Right, basically, the idea, I could go to AT&T, ask for information uh, you know, about my son's uh, use of his cell phone, but they only had to demonstrate that there, it was relevant to an ongoing investigation. So that could be, it's actually quite broad. And what the Supreme Court said is under those circumstances, that doesn't sufficiently protect against that arbitrariness uh, that the government could be engaged in. And they required that at the very least, there has to be some quantum of individual suspicion. So yes, the court plays a major role. Professor Cover, in 2012, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that forcing someone to unlock an encrypted hard drive violates the Fifth Amendment self-incrimination clause. What is your opinion on this holding? Well, so it, it of course depends on, on some of the factors uh, in, involved there. But I think the general idea there, right, and that Professor Ku alluded to this in, in his opening remarks, uh, is that in asking someone to provide a password, uh, to open up their phone, uh, you, are asking them to sh you are asking a person to share his or her thoughts and it has the potential to violate the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, right? So again, we go back to our phone. What's on here? All sorts of incredibly personal information, right? Thousands and thousands of documents. And by giving my password to get onto this phone, right, to, to essentially giving the key to my home, right, without a warrant necessarily, right, without anything, saying, yes, come into my home, look through everything, right? I run the risk of incriminating myself. And so I think the reasoning there is, is just right. Uh, I, I think it, it absolutely uh, implicates that right against self-incrimination. Um, there is this personal information that, that is precisely what the right is intended to protect against. Um, it's interesting, however, in a number of other issues, and I don't know if some of these questions will get at it, again, where you don't necessarily ask the individual to do so, right? You ask the company, you ask Apple to divulge that information. Right? then that right against self-incrimination is not necessarily implicated. 
right? And so what then do we do, right? What is the right that Apple can contend is being violated, right? What is there? And so there I think, and this gets back to actually the earlier question, I think to some extent about what do we want as a policy matter? Right, to determine and how do we run our society? How do we address these issues of encryption? And that really comes back to, again, a role for Congress to play. Right? Determining how are we going to determine the, the various iterations that can play out? What are the rules to be applied here? And that really is a role for Congress to play or you will see numerous debacles as we saw with post San Bernardino, right? with a court issuing or, or seeking, uh, the government seeking an all writs act, right? in which forcing Apple to do the work, in essence, of the government that they claim they weren't able to do. Right? So, you know, by and large, in, in, in line with what the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals held, I think they got it right in terms of self-incrimination. Um, but I think these issues are much broader than that and require a congressional role. So the 11th Circuit case raises, I'll, I'll go a little more into the weeds here uh, on that one, right? Because uh, part of the argument is, well, you know, what's really what's the difference between a password and a key, right? Should we have, should there really be a functional difference between me unlocking this with my thumb versus me giving you a four digit number, right? Or uh, if you knew use better passwords, right? Some entire phrase uh, or just a random selection of numbers or an electronic device that provides that same thing, right? So if I have a rolling key that uses a digital code to unlock a device, that's actually, while more practically protective of my, uh, my data, it's actually less protective if you think of it as self-incrimination or not. Uh, to me, that doesn't make any sense. That's the wrong question to be fundamentally asking. And part because, well, if in the old days, the government could always take out a sledgehammer and destroy your safe. Right? If you didn't want to turn over that information, uh, they would either pick it uh, or they would destroy it. And the argument has been that we can't do that with technology. Well, as the Apple case demonstrated, that's not true, right? And in fact, ever since Apple, there's kind of been one go-to provider, uh, this Israeli company that argues that they can crack any iPhone uh, at any time, right? So uh, partly is, should we force the individual to do that for the government or just require the government to do that on their own? Uh, the worst part, though, is the kind of esoteric argument that the actual courts are engaged in, right? So is this a key or a combination? Or more importantly, today, the courts are essentially arguing over whether it's something that's a foregone conclusion, right? So uh, if I get, if they arrest me and this is my phone, one argument is, well, it's a foregone conclusion that I know the password to my phone. And so if they've asked me for it, I can't deny that because in the end, uh, that's all I'm giving them is a password. Uh, and even if they, what they find on this, they have no idea what could be on the phone, uh, they are still entitled to me turning over the password, which then lets them investigate my phone. Uh, what the 11th Circuit did, and I agree with Professor Cover, did well, uh, is essentially say, well, we have to be more careful than that. At some times, if I say, there's child pornography on that hard drive, and there are cases like this. And we know that because we found child pornography on your desktop, uh, and we have a witness to testify that you are often watching child pornography, uh, and we have other evidence to suggest that there's child pornography on that drive. Now we can ask you to turn over your password. Right? Under those circumstances, uh, there's evidence to believe uh, that, that is, the password is relevant, there's evidence on that hard drive, uh, and as a result, it no longer violates uh, the right against self-incrimination. Um, but the question is, do we do that, or do we just say, no, it's just the password that's the foregone conclusion? Now, I would only uh, just add that, it, it, going back to also the, the earlier question, it, it, the technological advances that we see, we see some of the limits of what the court can do. And often what they are doing is applying prior reasoning from really a different era. Uh, so in the Fourth Amendment or even in the Fifth Amendment context as well, you'll see courts often use analogies, right? So they'll, they'll suggest that certain things relating to the internet are just like looking at an envelope, right, on the outside. Uh, and they really, these are oranges and apples, or really not even, you know, both fruit. Uh, you know, they're, they're decidedly different. Uh, and so again, it speaks to some of the limits of both the court's arguably capacity. Uh, you have a quite uh, older court uh, that's not necessarily as conversant in technology. Um, I 
think I can't remember now which oral argument. I think you know one of the justices sort of revealed that he or she did not really know how to use a smartphone. Um, that becomes somewhat problematic as they are making rulings on smartphones and exactly how they operate. Um, but it also suggests again a need for advances in the law, the role of Congress to play, uh, and the limitations at times uh, of the courts on what they can speak on on these issues. Professor Ku. Since encrypted cell phones are otherwise inaccessible to the law enforcement community, could a law making all cell phones accessible to investigators who have a valid search warrant still violate the Fourth Amendment reasonable searches and seizures clause? So could the could it violate the Fourth Amendment? Uh, and that's actually an interesting question to help uh, you know explain this to the rest of the audience. Right? So often in the decryption cases, right, where the government is asking for your password, uh, they actually have a for, uh, a search warrant. So they've gone into your house and said, uh, based on this evidence, we believe there to be child pornography at this residence on this computer. Uh, here's the evidence that we have. We've presented it to a magistrate. We have the warrant. Uh, and the, then they get there and they find the other evidence. But the main problem for them is then they can't get into the hard drive. Right. Uh, and if you had left it unlocked, no problem, <laughs> they could get there. Uh, but it, once, it, once, it's in, once it's password locked, then they have to ask you for that password, which then raises the Fifth Amendment problem. Right. So in these kind of in decryption cases, so that individual suspicion uh, part is missing. Right. We often know that you, there, you're a kind of, there are reasons to be focusing on the defendant here. Uh, what's often lacking, however, is kind of limiting the scope of that, right? What, you know, you think maybe something's on the hard drive. What's the evidence that there is something on the hard drive? Uh, what are we going to do to potentially mitigate the amount that the government is searching on your hard drive? And I don't know about the most of you, uh, most of us use one password to protect any number of things, uh, right? And then unlocking one device also has the potential to al unlock access to multiple devices and platforms, a point that the Supreme Court made clearly in the Riley case where they said your smartphone uh, is not something that it, it requires a warrant to get into, right? Um, now there, they didn't address whether or not they can make you give up the password. Right? But the idea basically is that we need to have the government say, this is why I'm interested, this is how, uh, what I'm looking for, and these are the circumstances in which we should be searching for this. It's not a license to go engage on a phishing expedition through your files, even if there's reason to suspect that you are engaged in other activities, right? So if we think uh, someone's in involved or has child porn, does that mean the government, after opening the hard drive, should look at your health records? Uh, or your financial records. Uh, and again, I mentioned it earlier, the Wiretap Act is really kind of, in my view, the proper model for this. Right? The Congress stepped in after the Supreme Court said, well, there's really no expectation of privacy in your telephone calls uh, because essentially you're sharing it with another person uh, and it's often, uh, it takes place on property that's not part of your property. And Congress said, no, there is actually a fundamental problem with law enforcement listening to our telephone calls all the time. Uh, and it said, these are the circumstances law enforcement can use uh, wiretapping, right? They limit it to certain kinds of crimes. Uh, these are the conditions in which law firm can, uh, law enforcement can engage in wiretapping, uh, and fundamentally, re for example, requiring them to limit the amount that they're listening to in order to not uh, hear too many uh, conversations or too much conversations that's not relevant to the investigation. Uh, and we really should be asking for this uh, for encryption and decryption under all circumstances. Right now, the court is going to give us some of a backstop to that. Um, but right now, I think we're moving in a direction where the rule will be your password is a foregone conclusion, which then opens up the Pandora box of all the data that is encrypted, even if you have a search warrant. Uh, and, and maybe that, that tees up well, uh, just to maybe go back to just some of the few basic facts of the San Bernardino matter, just to get a sense of it. Because again, as I alluded to, it wasn't really a Fourth Amendment issue there. Right? So if people remember, this was a tragic uh, terrorist attack in San Bernardino, California. California, Saeed Farouk uh, killed 14 individuals. Um, and that he and, and his wife destroyed their personal cell phones. So those cell phones were not an option for the government to use to sort of piece together what had happened and, and, and conduct further terrorism investigations. But there was a phone that was actually owned by his employer. 
right? actually a local government entity, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and the government wanted access to this phone. And it was one of those phones where if you tried the password 10 times, the phone would, for all intents and purposes, blow up. Right? I mean, it would not be accessible any longer. Um, and so what they wanted to do, right? so there was no Fourth Amendment right here. Right? Mr. Farouk was deceased. Um, the entity was, was happy to hand over the phone. They weren't disputing it. The issue was the government needed, in order to get access, they needed Apple to essentially provide access. But it wasn't even that complicated. The way the technology was in that iOS phone system, Apple didn't have the means to do so. And so what the government was seeking was saying, Apple, you need to get your hotshot engineers, your top notch te technology trillion dollar company, right, and figure out how to gain access for the government. And they pursued this sort of very old 1789 All Writs Act, which essentially can deputize any of us, right, to aid the government in very precise circumstances. And that is what Apple was fighting. I right, was fighting this issue. And so it wasn't a Fourth Amendment, right? Although I think in many respects, if we think of these deeper, here on Constitution Day, these deeper principles that the Constitution does support, right, which was, as Apple, and admittedly, it might seem a little ironic when a trillion dollar company is saying, you know, we're fighting, we're David against Goliath, you know, it's more like <laughs> Goliath against Goliath uh, here. Um, but, but essentially saying, look, we, we represent certain privacy interests here. We can't be forced to do this. If we are forced to do this, uh, A, we will provide access to all other uh, phones, essentially, was one of their arguments, but also this more fundamental notion of a balancing of powers right, against the government, against the executive, protecting civil liberties. And so you know, that is, is the debate that we are, it, it, it was held for another day. The court didn't have to rule because this Israeli company uh, was able to aid the government. Uh, although, and I will just actually one other addition, uh, there was an inspector general report in terms of the federal government's actions in this whole uh, uh, event. And it, and it turned out that there was at best mis miscommunication on the part of the various branches of the FBI, at worst, pure dishonesty. Uh, in terms of actually the federal government knowing, or certain components of the FBI, knowing actually how to gain access to this phone. Uh, and so perhaps it was just one branch of the FBI not speaking to another, um, but it may also have been duplicity there. Uh, but again, these are larger issues that we are going to be fought for another day. I believe we do have time for one more question from the panel before we turn it over to audience questions. So, Mr. McGrath. Professor Cover. How can the government protect public safety without infringing on privacy? For example, what could the government do to keep us safe besides creating generic encrypted keys? Well, I, you know, I, I guess it's, it, it's partly how we define safety, uh, you know, in terms of, I mean, I think these writ large issues. Um, there are, I think, a lot of rights neutral ways uh, in which the government um, can provide safety. Um, and so, I, you know, I think it's, it's a question of whether they really need uh, this sort of access. Uh, I mean, what has sort of come out is that if you're talking about a very discreet uh, type of, of bad guy, if you will, uh, that knows how to encrypt, that knows how to go dark, uh, as is the, the terminology that the FBI frequently uses um, in terms of preventing any government access. Um, and so if that is the case, the question is also whether the government is seeking, you know, far too greater powers than they want, right? So to have a key, a backdoor key is often the terminology used within the encryption context, right? The idea is that the government then would have a means, and this I think would be, you know, going way too far, uh, to get access to every uh, single device. Um, you know, that is, is a great concern, and I think corporations rightly raise that. Uh, there's also sort of the, you know, um, you know, dangerous path of unintended consequences. So in the, this, in theory, is to provide security, but suddenly this information can become accessible to the very bad guys that the government purports to, to stop and interdict. Uh, and so there is very much a problem of that, you know, sort of contagion uh, or spreading of that very information. Um, I think there are, there is certainly, uh, and a debate is going on with, with uh, technological engineers and the government uh, and trying to work together to figure out some sort of compromise. There are means perhaps where there can be backdoors for certain devices, perhaps some people have talked about, but certain, uh, you know, uh, apps and programs, you know, not so. So it may be far more difficult to gain access to WhatsApp, for, some, for example, in terms of that encryption. Uh, but maybe some devices, there is some sort of, of key that could be created. Uh, that is certainly beyond my ken in terms of you know, technological capability. Um, but I think you know, there has to be this discussion. There has to be this uh, 
uh, collaboration between these groups to figure this out. Uh, not to show my age, though thankfully uh, my physical appearance doesn't show my age as, uh, <laughs> that, that badly. Uh, I remember back in the beginning of internet law, uh, it, we were participating in debates about encryption, uh, especially about the role of government in maintaining encryption keys or finding third parties that could be trusted to possess or have access to those keys. Uh, and I'd be remiss to point out that, uh, to not point out that Professor Peter Younger, uh, who was on the faculty uh, back in the 90s, was actually, is a named party in one of the most important encryption cases uh, at the time, which was that encryption and programming itself uh, could be protected in terms of sharing uh, under free speech uh, principles, right? So that the government couldn't prevent uh, the dissemination of encryp encryption programs or the understanding of encryption technology uh, on the idea that it was somehow a threat to national security. Um, but the main problem has always been technologically. You create these back doors, they're back doors, right? So anyone can ultimately exploit them. Last year's uh, disclosure that the NSA had been hacked, uh, leading to the use of many of the hacking tools that the NSA had created, uh, and for other circumstances, you know, proved what we were all concerned about at the time, which is once you make it possible to break this technology very clearly, it will ultimately get exploited. Um, and so for me, this is really an example of where maybe it makes sense for society and for individuals to determine when it's fair to require the individual to disclose their password. Right? That is the much easier and much less dangerous option than essentially putting all of our data at risk. Right? Identify when uh, you can make me turn over my password because you have evidence of, that I committed a crime. Uh, and if you can't, force your way in, then maybe there will be circumstances in, when, in which I should provide that to you. But otherwise, you know, as we've seen, the government, despite what it says about encryption, which is what it's been saying about encryption since we had computer technology, uh, has always been wrong. The factual predicate that they cannot break into the encryption has always been disproven, uh, at, least until, <laughs> at least till today. Yeah, I, I would only add, I mean, I, I think the, the problems and challenges that the government claims are, are overstated. Uh, a lot of that we don't know entirely because there remains a huge veil of secrecy that the government employs in the law enforcement and national security context. But, you know, if you go and look at any uh, technological technology companies uh, or carrier, internet service provider, uh, transparency reports, they all, they all have this, right? And it, will, it, it documents in pretty good detail. Uh, the level of cooperation that even Apple and all these other companies is uh, engaging in with the government. They churn over thousands of pages, of in millions of uh, pages of information and respond to all sorts of data requests and churn that over. Right? So to be sure, there are these notable exceptions. And in fact, I think there is room for a cynical viewpoint that Apple did this in large measure as the greatest advertisement ever for <laughs> Apple, right? Hey, you want your privacy protected? Go to Apple. But actually, if you look at their transparency reports, I would contend that it may belie that assertion. Uh, there is a lot of cooperation that the technology companies engage in. Uh, and Apple is, you know, forget about them. You know, look at, look at the, the, the phone carriers, right? The AT&T, Verizon. They are getting hundreds of thousands of requests and generally complying with this. Now, in most cases, it's probably not that controversial, the level of cooperation and what it's about. Um, but they are turning over things, often through subpoenas and other sorts of orders, short of a warrant. Um, and so I don't think I don't I think we should not be fooled uh, into believing that there is not a pretty significant security apparatus running quite well that involves an extensive amount of cooperation between corporations and government, and that is a constitutional threat, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, the speakers will now accept questions from the audience. Please keep your questions concise and respectful. Uh, and there's the microphone that uh, our wonderful volunteer will be bringing to uh, audience members. Hello. Uh, this one is for, for both professors, but Professor Ku said something specifically that made me think of it. Um, in the beginning, you were talking about the importance of congressional action, um, which made me think a little bit of Justice Alito's dissent in Carpenter. Um, and so I'm wondering whether, so I like the outcome of Carpenter, 
Um, I'm a little confused how the majority reached the decision, um, and I've read it a couple times. So I wanted I wanted to know whether you think, even though Carpenter might be a nice decision um, in terms of outcome, whether you think that it puts Fourth Amendment protections on kind of shaky ground. Good question. Uh, so uh, again, Carpenter is the cell phone cell tower case, and there has been an approach by some of the justices. Uh, so for, fortunately, in my view, a minority of the justices today uh, that will say, well, if Congress or the states create a procedure, that's enough. Right? Uh, to the extent that you know people like Professor Ku are worried about arbitrary government power and focusing on the wrong people just for the wrong reasons, uh, if Congress or the states provide the framework that's good enough, right? We kind of control that. Uh, there were arguments in the 60s that kind of local law enforcement's own best practices and their policies should be part of the guide there uh, as well. So if you're not following your own internal rules, you're violating uh, constitutional concerns protected by the Fourth Amendment, and maybe that should be enough. Um, I've never believed that, and I think that's why I said the majority did the absolute right thing, right? Which is first, uh, look to see, is there something that Congress has done? Uh, what are the rules and the limits provided by Congress, and then to test that against uh, the provisions of the Fourth Amendment. Right? So uh, as Professor Cover pointed out earlier, Congress has in, you know, interceded in some instances, and after 9-11, uh, they interceded in what uh, was tantamount to a blank check, right? which was essentially, go ahead, uh, you have the authorization to use military force, and for the most part, we're not going to describe any details of that, and we'll assume that you'll employ all the authority you need, and then ultimately they uh, they passed the Patriot Act, uh, amended uh, for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and authorized all sorts of government surveillance that we might otherwise find questionable. Right. So to the extent I believe that Congress has a role, that's their role. Right. They should be doing that. The court then has a fundamental role, as it always does, to test whether or not the legislature has exceeded its powers as well. Right? And so the Fourth Amendment gives us an example, a very clear example, of what the Constitution thinks is required government for a government search. You know, that there has to be individual suspicion. There has to be uh, evidence uh, f f that that person has committed a crime. Uh, whether it's probable cause or some higher standard, uh, that the, the court can debate about. And we're kind of seeing that starting to play out now. Because not only is Justice Alito focused on the role of the court, uh, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan have also focused on the need and the importance of looking to Congress when the executive branch is claiming all sorts of unfettered power to engage in surveillance. Yeah, I, mean, I would only add, I, I think it, look, that, that order, the, the, the order that, that the government did obtain in Carpenter, right, was pursuant to a legislative understanding of a prior state of the law, right? This was the third party doctrine that we, we talked about, which generally suggested that there is no search, there is no Fourth Amendment right implicated if all you're talking about is information that you have shared with the third party. So in this case, your phone location data. Uh, and then it's not content, right? It's actually not content information, it's this metadata, it's this location. And I think just simply times have changed. And that's what the court was rec recognizing at some level. And it's a nudge to Congress to, I think, adapt. It's not to say that there can't be some other statute passed that I think might provide the, you know, not too much of a burden on the government. But the idea there was that qualitatively, this is different, right? It's not the same thing as getting just a business record or through uh, a wiretap or a pen register, as was the case where the third party doctrine really was formulated. You're going to know every spot where this person went. And so, you know, as the court has uh, you know, documented, you would know that they went to their psychologist, and you would know that they went to their marriage counselor, and you, know, you would know that they went to their chiropractor, and their priest, and their imam, and whomever, right? And all of that personal information, so that it made it a qualitatively different analysis. Um, I don't know. I, I find that analysis fairly compelling. Um, I think there is some question about now whether it calls into question a lot of subpoenas uh, and subpoena power, and sort of what are the limits on that. Um, and so there's certainly work to be done, but if anything, that's a kick to Congress to, to fix this. And by the way, while we're waiting for the microphone, Professor Cover's point about the role of private parties and especially corporations in the government. Uh, we, we hosted a conference years ago at Seton Hall when I was there, and right after 9-11, we're talking about security. And one of my colleagues and co-authors, uh, counsel from AT&T at the time, said, that should be our greatest concern. 
that after 9-11, it wasn't so much the government's authority and power, but the fact that the government was going to ask AT&T and Google and all these other companies in Apple to be a partner in this process, both in good ways and potentially troubling ways. And not be able to disclose. Exactly, right. So I wonder if you could extend this discussion to the situation where the owner of the phone is uh, a French citizen or a Russian citizen who's uh, just as active in using it and it perhaps is uh, using the same carriers that already we're familiar with or perhaps other carriers. I know that's a big question, but... So do you, do you mean the, a foreign national in the United States, for example? Either in the United States or, or elsewhere. elsewhere. Well, well, the easiest response is else, a foreign national elsewhere, they're not protected by the Constitution at all. Right? Uh, the more difficult one is when a foreign national is in the United States uh, and whether or not, one, they would fall under FISA, right? whether or not there's a reason to treat them as an agent of the foreign uh, power, or they're just a tourist here. right? And they're the same reason for looking into the tourist phone would be the same reason for looking into a citizen's phone. And under those circumstances, we generally say that the, the Fourth Amendment would apply to law enforcement uh, just the same way it would apply to a citizen. Yeah, I don't think I need to add that. Um, I'm puzzled about something here. Um, there's really two things here. One is uh, what makes breaking encryption different from anything else? I mean, I mean, is there anything specific about breaking encryption that's different from any other thing? And the second question is, um, we're talking about this, the, all these events and all, the, all these tensions, as if a 231-year-old document. Uh, should have much to do with how we think through these issues of freedom and security. And is that a really good idea? <laughs> well, start? Well, let, me, let me take the latter <laughs> one first. Uh, uh, I think embedded in that question is, uh, is, a, is a, a fair conclusion there as well. Uh, no, there's, there's a lot of uh, limitations to be short of the Constitution. And, and I think actually, Supreme Court, when delving into particularly issues of privacy and technology, usually begins with some admonition to that effect of saying, we would really prefer that Congress to get involved and, 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 and the like. Uh, and a recognition uh, of a desire not to step in and make determinations, recognizing in fact that technology is moving so quickly uh, and that its decisions can be outdated quite quickly. Um, yeah, I think there is a lot to be said that the, the Constitution can't speak uh, to all of these, these issues. I do think the general principles of, of, of balancing, notwithstanding Professor Ku's admonition uh, about it, I do think speak to a certain truth. And so these larger principles that I think are embedded in the Constitution can apply here, which is to say, what, what, how do we balance society? How much power do we want the government to have? Uh, and what is our expectation of privacy? Um, there's a terrific footnote, I can't remember in which of, I think it's in one of the third party cases, that in, in describing what is the expectations of privacy and, and what they are, you know, it says, well, it could be that one day in our society, you know, you'll have some uh, draconian government, you know, that will say essentially, like, we are watching and observing everything, you know, and that we will then have to reevaluate, you know, what it means to have an expectation of privacy. Um, and so, you know, I think this is an ongoing thing. I do think, yes, the Constitution is limited to be sure, um, but to the extent the matter is kicked to the courts, uh, I'm not sure what the courts are left to do. Uh, I certainly don't view it as a question that uh, courts should view as non-justiciable, uh, for example. I think they, they do need to uh, embrace their, their, their obligations of judicial review there. Uh, but it's a limited one, and uh, I think congressional action is needed, and it's certainly been a, a refrain here. Yeah, and while I agree with Professor Cover that clearly you know, the courts play a role, if, you're say, if the question is in part, what does a 231-year-old document have to say about encryption or internet surveillance? Of course, specifically nothing, right? I, I mean, uh, there was a comedian that I just saw within the last year who, you know, everyone always says, well, the framers would look at the internet and not understand it. And the comedian's point was they would look at a popcorn maker <laughs> and not understand that either. And, 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 I, and that's fundamentally true. And of course, the you know, for people like myself, it's it's the certain key principles and first principles in particular that the Constitution embodies that have made it last for 231 years with 
thousands of pages of Supreme Court interpretation. Um, because the other side is, do you really want a group of justices, mostly in their 70s and 80s, who, as Professor covers it, in Riley, one of them didn't even know what a smartphone really was or didn't use a smartphone, for them to say there is a qualitative difference before, you know, before we have constitutional protection. Right? It was only because we were thankful that so many of the justices had an iPhone right, or had a Samsung phone that they recognized how much information is accessible in this device that Riley, uh, which said, get a warrant if you want to search a cell phone incident to arrest, uh, came out the way it did. Uh, again, back in the early days of the internet, uh, someone I used to work for had to bring a computer cart out to the Third Circuit in order to demonstrate what the internet was to the justices in order to determine whether or not Congress could constitutionally, under the Communications Decency Act, prohibit indecent speech. Right? So we're often having people who have the least understanding of the technology making some of the most fundamental decisions. And as to encryption, uh, this is where I've played the Asian card multiple times in my career. It's not because I'm actually fundamentally good at technology, but because people think I am. Uh, it gives me an entry into certain discussions. And, and what I always argue is that technology is used by a lot of people just to baffle the audience. Uh, encryption, oh my goodness, math, right? <laughs> I, I didn't understand algebra, how am I going to understand encryption? Uh, and so the truth is yes, right? Encryption isn't very new. I mean, first of all, encryption has existed for thousands of years. Um, it is not really fundamentally different other than it may be harder to crack encryption depending on the level of encryption. Uh, but people have been able to hide all sorts of information very well, very uh, in very ingenious ways throughout human history. Uh, but I do think in the end, and as our discussion says, people have been able to break that math too, right? So, but it's, so it's this fear of, it's math. We'll never be able to do this, right? And then they'll throw out some made up number of the supercomputers and computational hours uh, that it might take to crack it, uh, just the same way we throw out statistics uh, on the spur of the moment, right? So it, it is that fear that maybe we can't resolve this because it's so new, as opposed to saying, no, we've been able to handle this in the past, and we'll be able to handle this in the future, right? As Professor Covers suggests. I think what we not worry, what I'm not worried about is the capability of uh, uh, Apple protecting or not protecting my my data. In fact, it was horrible news for Apple that the government broke their encryption <laughs> shortly <laughs> thereafter, despite the PR of saying we're not going to turn it over. <clears throat> but I trust that our government has a lot more sophisticated technology that they're using for their own purposes. Well, the Russians do. Yeah. <laughs> there is, you know, there's, oh. a, sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's a one of the preeminent privacy scholars and uh, wrote a brief in, in, in opposition to Carpenter, Orrin Kerr, um, you know, has, a, has a theory of the Fourth Amendment, though, that speaks to some of this, which is sort of that it's, it's, it's an idea of equilibrium adjustment. Uh, and that, you know, with various times and changes in technology, it's always trying to seek out this sort of balance. Uh, and so, you know, the government should never have too much power and ability to violate people's privacy, and individuals should never be, you know, so removed and protected from the government's reach. And there's some sort of balance that is to be adjusted. That's a role that the courts and Congress uh, have to play to ensure. So ironically, Warren years ago argued that encryption should not give you a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, not because encryption was either fundamentally difficult or you know, easy to crack, um, but his idea was that encryption is essentially having information in plain view. So that it would be no different than uh, you know, translating your document into French. Uh, the only difference is you needed a much more sophisticated translator at the other end. So, uh, Oren's a wonderful guy and a great thinker, but he has a perspective that I think a lot of people would be a little skeptical with at times. Hi, so um, when you were talking about passwords, I kept couldn't help but think about a teacher I had in high school who kept her us uh, post-it note with her password, like right on her computer. So in that situation, if you didn't have a warrant, would you, but there was a literally a post-it note right there, would that, would law enforcement still be able to get into the computer? Yes, 
Okay. <laughs> yep. As long as they had a warrant to be there to begin with, it, it's right in plain view. They're able to look at that. It's probably even within the area that they were entitled to search in the first place. So if you want to protect your information, don't write password <laughs> down on you. you know, or, or keep it anywhere close, right? I know people who keep it under their desks and things like that. It's, it's all available if they're doing a search. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Although, I, I guess I would wonder, I mean, there may be limits. I mean, so the Riley case uh, that, that you referenced earlier, uh, so that case, just as a introduction to people, was the concept was there is a, a concept of um, a right to search incident to arrest. So if you arrest someone, you can often, in fact, search the various items in the car, things that are on them, you can actually search, and without a warrant. Right? So that, that, that's the key point. And in that case, a, a smartphone was, was on the individual, not a particularly sophisticated one, if I, if I recall correctly. Um, and, and the court ruled there that, you know, essentially, look, this has all sorts of information. So it, it is significantly different from what the exception was intended to cover, right? It wasn't like, you know, what's, what's the most that someone, when they're searched incident to arrest, is going to have maybe a few books on them, maybe, I don't know, maybe you keep your pocket diary or what have you, right? But you can't contain all of the, I forget, the intricacies or indignities of life that are on your, your smartphone. Um, and so there was somewhat of a qualitative distinction. And so, I don't know, I, a, a, a lawyer might be able to at least marshal, I think, some arguments. They might ultimately fail there, but, 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 that in, in essence, I think like that which is going to be searched uh, may have some impact, I think, on a court's reasoning. Yep. And they can also, you know, they have access to a computer and your password is password, they can just enter that as well. That doesn't violate the Fifth Amendment either. Kind of um, like extrapolating on that, you were talking about one password or any of those other password managements. So if they are able to gain access to that, um, how is that much different than you know gaining access to a house and finding a you know a notebook with 15 different passwords listed on it? Is it very similar? Is it treated differently? Well, and that's the danger, right? Uh, and so <laughs> what I'm concerned about is this kind of movement, which is actually you know Professor Kerr's argument here for passwords that it's a foregone conclusion that if we find you and your computer, that you know the password. So therefore, having you disclose the password isn't giving the government anything that they didn't already know, uh, which is the foregone conclusion rule. So there's no Fifth Amendment violation there. Uh, the concern would be, well, if you disclosing that password somehow then maybe uh, implicated the fact that maybe you were engaged, you had documents that you weren't supposed to have, um, that would be a Fifth Amendment problem. Right? Then you'd be providing some evidence against yourself. But just the password, if we focus on that, some of the argument is that that's not a problem. And yet what you're saying it is what I'm noting too, that that password can lead to any number of other passwords and other information that may have absolutely no connection or relationship to what the government was initially searching for. And that is the danger. Right? So it may be that it's a foregone conclusion that my, I know the passwords of my iPhone. Right, otherwise, I own a plastic brick. <laughs> right, but uh, if if they can get that just because it's my phone, then they have, as you know, Professor Cover is saying, what the court's starting to recognize as a qualitatively different act, level of access to my information. Right, most of us, with one or two passwords, you can probably get access to every bit of information that we have. And, and if you can't do it from just the one password, uh, you can do it because you'll find other information that will connect you to other accounts that may already have the passwords on your uh, computer that will automatically enter them when they pull it up. So it's, uh, there is a fundamentally important reason for the courts to follow what they did in Carpenter, which is ask what information did the government want from the device, not just whether or not it was a foregone conclusion that you knew the password, right? But was it a foregone conclusion that they knew you had child porn on that hard drive and this was just getting access to it? Just to follow on that, I mean, of course, it would depend, of course, it, had they followed the scope of the search, the initial warrant to begin with. So, you know, if you had a, a warrant to only search for, I don't know, you know, items that were as large as a human body and you're looking in certain locations, where the password is kept and it's outside the scope of that warrant, that might not be actually lawfully obtained information, right? So that could limit it. Um, so that's at least one consideration. The other thing I think it's important to say, and obviously some law enforcement might disagree, I, you know, a warrant is not always so hard to obtain, 
So I think you know, understanding in all of this is sort of you know it's not necessarily this you know you either get privacy or you know or or you know all security is violated. Um, no, sometimes it requires to just go that extra step and provide enough information to show that there's probable cause that a crime uh, is, is involved here. Um, and it, it's not such a high threshold. Um, so we're not necessarily saying that all your privacy is protected. No, you go before those imperfect judges that uh, Professor Ku outlined that the framers were worried about. We have time for one or two more questions this is from the audience, if any remain. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for humoring me. Okay, how do you think um, 23andMe or Ancestor DNA held by third parties will be handled post Carpenter? So, is the so I just, the context in which they're searching or getting that information? Well, you know, the, what's the big serial killer yeah. in California, right? So, so they didn't even need to request the information, right, from 23andMe the, or the provider. Right? They, they just created a profile, right, used the DNA of the unknown suspect, right, and then had that information <laughs> turn up uh, and then go after, the, go talk to the relatives that had... Uh, the similar DNA. I, I mean, in, in some respects, that's basically just very brilliant law enforcement work. I, I, I mean, it was very, you know, they already had access to the suspect's DNA. There was no privacy protection in there. Uh, and the argument would be, this was why the privacy or debate is so problematic. Well, all the relatives, uh, you know, share that DNA information with these third parties, knowing that other people may upload their DNA without actually having their, you know, for you know, uh, knowledge ahead of time. Uh, and and so, what did the government do that was different than some distant relative? Um, especially since they didn't break any laws in order to get the access to the data itself in the first place. Though they did violate the terms and conditions of those sites, right, which claim that you actually are the person whose DNA uh, you're uploading. I, I think that's an example where if we follow Fourth Amendment analysis, they did the right thing. Uh, it troubles me uh, that they thought that they had the authority to do that, uh, which is why I've argued consistently that this is one of those things where Congress should be required to give them that authority. Like, <laughs> I'll admit, no court to date has adopted my view on this. But this is where the fundamental problem lies, right? That if you just decide that this is what we want to do because it's smart, right? It's a good way to solve these unsolved crimes. Then we just have to depend on whether or not the justices will say, well, that was an invasion of privacy or not. Rather than saying, no, before you can start mining DNA, right? You have to be given that authority and given the terms in which you can use it and create certain protections in addition to the Fourth Amendment safeguard. Yeah, I, I would only add, I guess, just post Carpenter, I mean, one of the components of the third party doctrine is this notion that you are voluntarily giving up your information. And the idea of why the third party doctrine didn't necessarily apply in Carpenter was sort of the idea is that you can't not use a cell phone today in society, right? It is indispensable uh, to use the court's language. Whereas, I suppose people could argue, you know, it is not absolutely necessary that you divulge your genetic information to a corporate entity and, you know, search your hereditary background. Um, and so that's at least one component that would suggest that maybe the third-party doctrine doesn't obtain there and doesn't in another context. Um, but that's one, one consideration. Look, the other, and it's fundamentally one, is that, you know, we all need to be better about protecting our privacy in, 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 sharing, in sharing your information with these various third-party providers you need to recognize the great ease with which the government can access that information. Forget about the fact that your information can also be lost and these corporate entities can do who knows what with that information, which some people find far more problematic than invasive. Um, so, you know, ultimately it does stand with us in, you know, using various encryption devices and probably more than one password and certainly not posting it on top of your computer. <laughs> do any additional questions remain from the audience? Okay. <laughs> 
Um, our guests will now proceed with clo closing statements. For Co Professor Cover and Professor Ku, you each have five minutes. Professor Cover, you may begin with your closing remarks. Um, you know, I guess I would say that uh, to, to, to follow on, on Professor White, White's, uh, I think, very fair you know, question in terms of you know, what is the utility of a, of a 231 page, uh, 31 year old document um, uh, is that, you know, we, we have faced these disputes and, and debates over privacy for a long time and the Constitution has undergirded them. But I think I would uh, echo something that Professor Ku also said, which is that there are these general principles that the Constitution does stand for. Um, and that we have to think of the Bill of Rights, these particular rights, as in addition to giving individuals rights, they are limitations on the government. And the Fourth Amendment can be thought of as one. Um, and so it is incumbent on us as a society uh, to better define what we mean by privacy. Um, it's sort of our right that I think is in some ways being uh, abdicated uh, in, in irresponsible fashion. Uh, and it's one that we can secure because at least under the current jurisprudence, uh, what is a reasonable expectation of privacy is actually defined by us and by our behavior. Uh, and by our values. Uh, and it is one that I, I think I do see being eroded, not just by actions by corporations and governments, but by individuals. Uh, and so, you know, we are, uh, whatever it might be, a YouTube voyeuristic exhibitionist society, uh, there are consequences for that. Uh, and it is something, and maybe this sounds very fuddy duddy of me, uh, but, you know, we, we need to be aware of that. With every post we place on social media and, and what have you, I think our, our privacy rights do evaporate ever so. Uh, and so it's something that I think we should be vigilant in, in protecting. Um, thank you, Professor Cover. Uh, it's always a delight being with you and talking to you. Uh, I, I want to go, go back to my point. Let's not talk about privacy. Uh, <laughs> I know it, it's counter to, counterintuitive under these circumstances, but the, the, even the phrase privacy, what does it mean, right? I mean, more than one constitutional expert and member of the Supreme Court has said, I like my privacy, but you know, there's nothing in the Constitution that protects privacy. There, it does not, the word and the term does not appear in the Constitution. The Fourth Amendment, which everyone cites to, does not mention privacy. The Fifth Amendment doesn't mention privacy. The Fourteenth, all of these important constitutional protections and provisions that we rely on say nothing about. Um, it was actually created as a means of restricting individual freedom, right? In the idea, again, that if you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, the government doesn't need to comply with the Constitution's stated requirements of investigation and access uh, to information, right? So while we as individuals like to think of our privacy, legally it's a very dangerous term. Uh, and what the Constitution speaks to is security, right? And, and that's one of the other things that's so important here, right? Because when I know Professor Cover's balancing isn't the balancing I'm generally worried about, but what most people do, especially post 9-11, the balance is security versus privacy, right? And if the balance is 3,000 people dying uh, on September 11th versus a little intrusion on my cell phone, when I have done nothing wrong, most people will say, okay, security wins, right? Uh, whereas what we're talking about fundamentally here is security, security of the individual who is potentially a victim of crime or is a victim of crime, as well as security of law-abiding citizens from a government that may be overreaching and abusive. Uh, and under those circumstances, if we think about these are the concerns, right, the problem, when should government be able to access your data? How should it be able to get you to testify? But we can kind of move beyond the, what I think the courts should be criticized for, which is taking it upon themselves to determine what reasonable privacy is. Right? So while Professor Covers right, right, we have a sense of what privacy is and what should be protected. Uh, the research that's been done on this suggests that you can go and objectively uh, survey people on what their reasonable expectation of privacy is. The courts ignore that. They don't care at all. Right? It's ultimately their subjective determination that too much, you gave your DNA data to 23andMe. You don't even read the terms and service of 23andMe. So why should you have any expectation in privacy in this company uh, or that your data will be somehow otherwise protected? 
or you know every person has to walk around and with a cell phone and that information is there or you know your drone can easily fly over your house uh, and just as well as uh, you know United Airlines flight so what what kind of expectation of privacy do you have there uh, where you know again it does default to as Professor Cover suggests we have to be vigilant here right you can't just depend on the ACLU to bring these challenges you, you certainly can't depend on the courts to be uh, open to ideas of rights of privacy when a criminal defendant has been caught red-handed with child pornography uh, and they're raising fourth and fifth amendment arguments or right? we have to be proactive as citizens to say that no there are reasons why government should be investigating us and there are legitimate ways they should be investigating uh, potential crime uh, but there are legitimate interests on the part of the citizenry that deserve to be respected ladies and gentlemen the constitution day student committee expresses sincere appreciation to professor ku and Professor Cover for joining us today. We give special thanks to the Office of the President and Provost and to Vice President Lou Stark. We also thank many contributors. Please hold your applause until the end. The School of Law, the Department of Political Science, the Center for Policy Studies, the Case Western Reserve University Chapter of the Federalist Society, our student panelists, moderator, timers, and volunteers and our wonderful advisors, Dr. DeSwart, Dr. Dull, Dr. Lucker, Professor Tartikoff, and Dr. White. Everyone is now invited to proceed upstairs to Blackacre Lounge, where we will be serving refreshments. Professor Koo will be available to answer any questions that remain. Thank you. <laughs>